Margot is wearing the head of a bear. Willow is scaring the crows with a stare. Daphne is watching for she is quite stuck. We will see how many leaves we can pluck. Isn't it sweet? When we are hungry, we'll find things to eat. Stolen from sellers who shout in the street. Strawberries that dribble with juice in the heat. Ribbons are streamed from a magic machine. Powered by gypsies who look like a dream. Hello, uh, Mary Hooper. Thank you for joining us today. Today is the last of the seven salons. Uh, uh, I hope you can see me, I'm not sure. Um, today is the last of a series of seven salons or conversations produced by MSL, which have been running through June and July. These have highlighted stories from the Trinity Triangle, or otherwise known as the America Ground in the center of Hastings. If you missed any of them, links to all of the past salons are available on the MSL website. Um, this salon, Julie Gidlow and I, Julie, are you there? Uh, will take a, the long view of major hurricanes in Hastings, focusing on the 1824 hurricane, which devastated the America ground, and the 1987 hurricane, remembered by Hastings fishermen, Pete and Bud White and Peter White, and two Hastings residents, Philip Squire and Kevin Borman. We consider the impact of these storms and also think about the um, changes in the weather triggered by climate change and the increase in extreme weather events in more rain, uh, drought, higher temperatures, and extreme, and extreme kind of events like the storm Ch Kira, not Kiara. Um, if you have booked in, there is a Q&A box. And if you'd like, if you've got any questions or any comments, please go to that and we'll try to answer them at the end. So I think we will now be uh, looking at um, a video that is a series of recordings that I did with Hastings Fishermen. And the actual video is a, a fly past the coastline uh, filmed on a GoPro camera by Matt Robbins in his Eurostar light aircraft. So I hope you enjoy that and we'll be picking up with that video as we go through the salon. How much warning did you have of the hurricane? I'm not really sure. That's why, because we had a Coast Guard exercise that evening and uh, Bob Merson, that was his first uh, Coast Guard exercise of those things. And it was the, the night of the hurricane. We must have come down about four o'clock in the morning. Obviously. Yeah, it was still raging then. Quite early. We, we come down Courthouse Street, me, Bud, and the old man, and all the tiles were blowing off the roof. Someone had been uh, tiling the roof. All the tiles were blowing off. And when we walked back up again afterwards, all the tiles were stuck in the, in the ground. Yeah, right in there, three quarters of the way of the tile had gone right into the ground. Yeah. Well, because it was still been dark, because we couldn't see them tiles. No, it was dark. Yeah. If anybody had come down there at that particular moment, when they all started coming off, they could quite easily been killed. The ones who were stuck in the ground were stuck in my mind. Yeah. Because it's like, it's like, it's like to get a point off. Yeah, would have done. Yeah. Well, it's quite a lot of like, damage, things blowing away, things blowing everywhere. We got away quite low, actually, with the, the, um, the shed. It, it wasn't too damaged, pretty reasonable. The boats? What about boats? Well, that boat didn't think what happened there really was the, uh, the mizzen was blowing away when we come over and you could hear it rattling in the belt. And so we, uh, me and Bud went over there, got aboard the boat, climbed, climbed up the mast. This is a, a hurricane. I got up there and trying to get the, you know, the mizzen around to sort of tighten up again. again. And I always remember sort of uh, saying to him, Mr. Christian! And his crew, the new and the bouncy, they blew so hard you couldn't talk into the wind. You had to turn your head down so you could talk. You couldn't get your breath. You couldn't breathe. They denied that there was a hurricane coming. A woman had heard it on French radio, I think. In fact, she might have lived in France, I can't quite remember. But she phoned the BBC and asked if it was true that there was a hurricane coming. And Michael Fish came on to do his forecast at about 5 to 12 or something like that. And he was laughing and saying, no, no, there's not a hurricane coming. 
Obviously, the weather was going to be bad. They were forecasting strong winds. And unfortunately for my law and the rest of us here, we told the force. Decimated the place. Not a nice experience. Not a nice experience at all, was it, Buster? No. I've never talked about coming down very early in the morning from the hurricane. Yes, I was down in that morning as well. Yeah, 87, yeah. yeah. My dad rang me up that morning and said, you better get down here because the boat needs pulling up. And I live in Old London Road, just around, just not far from Bad, actually, just around the corner from Bad. I was driving, driving down the road. The first thing that I uh, that woke me up, if you like, was a tree laying across the road in Old London Road by Sacred Art School. We had just enough room to get around to, cool. to get down. And, uh, of course, got down the beach, parked the car. And the first thing I noticed was plastic fish boxes flying through the air, you know, with, 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 the, with the strength of the wind. And, obviously, the... the um, your face like being shot blasted wasn't it? with the yeah. grit and the sand where the wind was so strong you had a job to actually look into it because it, just, because it was blowing in your face I'll you know? tell you what I know just more than anything you couldn't look into the wind and breathe we'll um, pick up with that later on uh, I've got a note I've got a message on my screen to start my video so can you see me Julie I can see you. Good. <laughs> I hope everyone else can. <laughs> yeah, you look fine to me. Um, okay. Uh, perhaps if I so, click that, it'll go off. Yeah. Okay. Wonderful, there we are. wonderful to see that that film, isn't it? It's incredible. And yes, I, I, I recorded the fishermen and sort of edited it so that they come in and out. There, there was a lot more amazing stuff in that recording about freak waves and the, the shingle on the beach and but obviously you can't include all of that and I was just very lucky to that Matt uh, happened to be flying a couple of weeks ago take my camera record it and <laughs> I didn't know if it would come out and he'd never used one for but yeah. yeah so it was all great kind of coincidence and I'm very grateful to uh, Pete Pete and Bud and Pete White for for doing that so yeah so, so Julie yeah, no uh, that this leads us into um, your first uh, piece your first bit yeah. of research yeah yeah so I was gonna say it's 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 fabulous when you've got accounts like that so um, as a researcher you know I've, I'm looking a lot at historical accounts so written um, things that you know people have left diaries or journals letters things like that um, to hear the voices of people actually talking about their experiences in a storm is is phenomenal so um, what we're going to try and do today um, in this uh, webinar is put some flesh I think to the bones of some of the older historical storms that we know happened in Hastings um, and listening to the, the current accounts of people talking about storms from living memory really helps us to do that so it, it's phenomenal to get to hear you know what the, the fishermen have to say and, and others will hear later as well. Um, yes yeah, so it so, kind of materialised that you can smell it hear it feel it yeah. I did, did put yeah. a soundtrack but it actually just sounds like a kind of uh, bad computer rumble of <laughs> recordings of mine of storms. <laughs> but, yeah, yeah. But, it, it, it's hard unless you're actually in the storm to know that that's really a storm that you're hearing. It's, you know, it's okay, but, over to uh, you, thank you. Yeah, so it's, uh, as Mary says, um, you know, I'm a researcher, I, I work with MSL and I've been with MSL for now about six years and we've looked a lot at the America ground for various different projects and the uh, the main purpose of the salons uh, that we've been we've been looking at over the last seven weeks has been to look specifically at the America ground and its history in lots of different aspects. So we, we've looked at how it's been affected by COVID-19 and the lockdown um, and heard some of the stories of the people that lived here um, in the 1820s. So I've been looking um, particularly at um, the, his, the, well, the historical storm side uh, of Hastings and how how storms and weather and coastal erosion have affected this part of the coast um, over the course of the time there's been people living here. So to start off with, I have got some pictures that I'd like to show you. So if we have a look at the very first picture, um, that should be showing us um, the area that we're specifically looking at. When we get on later to, to look at the 1830 storms, uh, which happened um, in the, uh, really towards the end of, of the time that people were living on the America ground, um, we're, we're looking at a very small part of Hastings. And I just wanted everyone to have a look at this picture. So this was taken last week. And you can see that what we're looking at is a very small fraction of the, the coastline of Hastings. If you look to the left hand side, you can see this tall building, the tall white building. Uh, that's Palace Court. That's quite a noticeable landmark on the seafront. And if we come across to the right and travel along the seafront towards, there's a large white building, which is the Queen's Hotel. So come along the seafront there, that's it. So 
between the marker where it now is and Palace Court, that is the area of the America Ground. And it's called either the America Ground or the Trinity Triangle today. Um, back in the 1820s and 30s, it was known as the Priory Lands because there had once been a priory very near to this site. In fact, roughly on the site of ESK, which we can't see in this picture, but anyone local will know where that is. And the priory was quite a large land owning uh, establishment. It owned a huge amount of the land around Hastings, um, including um, the bit that now contains the shopping centre, which is why it's called Priory Meadow. Um, and we'll talk later about the Priory Stream, we'll, we'll see that as well. And I'd also just like to show people to the right hand side of the Queen's Hotel, you can see the cliff. And it's very small in the photograph, but up on the top of the cliff is the castle. So that just gives you a, a clear uh, location of the area of ground that we're talking about. And as I say, this was taken last week, but let's take you back a thousand years and show you the next picture, which is how this view looks. Uh, roughly at the time of the Norman invasion. And we're looking at pretty much the same view. You can see the, uh, the cliff with the castle on the top of it. And over on the far left hand side, um, you can see the white rock cliff it's over on the far left. And up on the top there is a church. This is roughly where Palace Court was in that previous photograph. And the church up on the top of White Rock was dedicated to St. Michael who is still today the patron saint of Hastings. So it was, it was probably, we don't know for sure, but this is probably where the large Anglo-Saxon settlement of Hastings was. Um, and we know this from archeology span and records of the time. Um, and it's not much Anglo-Saxon records of the time, but mostly from the archeology span that's been, been found up there. A lot of this has actually gone into the sea. So the, the cliff has, has had a lot of erosion over the years and the church, in fact, landed up falling into the sea eventually. By the 1820s there was one little bit of a wall left of it that may have been part of the original church but everything else had gone. But the thing that's really different as you can probably see is that where we have land today and buildings um, is sea and this we think was the original harbour of Hastings where shipbuilding was going on during the reign of King Harold so at the time of the Norman conquest. And there may have been a little bit of habitation just over to the right hand side of this cliff as well in the Bourne Valley, which is now the old town. Um, but predominantly the town was based around this estuary inlet, which was the natural harbour of Hastings. And you can see a, a rocky outcrop just in the bottom left hand quarter of the page. Um, this we'll see in later pictures as well. Um, it's very picturesque and, and I think 19th century artists like to draw that as well. So if we go on to the next slide we can see what this looked like on a map which is a map from 1291. Well I say it's from 1291 it actually appears in a book um, published in 1884 which you can see in the title at the top um, but purporting to be what the ground looks like in, in the 1290s and so you can see here that the haven um, which is the natural harbour that we just saw in the, the picture earlier, um, coming right the way inland. This is the Valley of Alexandra Park and running into this harbour at the top, you can see some rivers running through the land. Um, one of these rivers is the Priory Stream, which still runs today through Alexandra Park and it comes out on the beach. There's a, um, a pipe with water coming out of it. Um, that pipe is now the outfall of the Priory Stream. It's been running into that area for thousands of years. Um, it's culverted underneath the Queen's Road now, so we don't have a, a river to walk down through the town. Um, you can see how difficult it was to get from one side of the town to the other. So if you look on the left hand side, you can see where it says St. Leonard's and there's a track which comes up and around the top of this estuary mouth um, and then right the way over into Hastings. Um, at high water, this was the route that you would have to take to get from the west to the east or vice versa. Um, there'd be no crossing the Priory um, Harbour at that point. So it was quite difficult access. Um, this was all very soon to change. So in 1287, there was a really serious storm. Um, it was as serious, possibly even more so than the 1987 storm that we've just heard a little bit about. Um, and we know that it caused massive coastal change throughout the whole of East Sussex. 
uh, well certainly along this part of the coast. Um, so some of the uh, changes that happened were that Winchelsea, the original Winchelsea, uh, the village fell into the sea, so that was drowned. Um, the Winchelsea that we know today um, was built slightly further inland, up on higher uh, level ground, and that was built in the 1290s, in the reign of Edward I. And um, Edward, I don't know if it was his idea, but anyway, during his reign, they had the, the idea to, um, to basically build a new town. So it's a medieval new town. Um, so it's laid out in a grid pattern, so it's a very strange kind of village. It's not like a normal um, English village that's kind of grown organically. It was designed on this grid pattern with right angle roads. So it, it's rather peculiar, but it was designed like that in the 13th century. Um, but it's a long way inland from where the original Winchelsea was. And uh, New Romney, which was the, the premier um, harbour at the time, um, the river Rother used to run out through New Romney. And there was such a lot of um, shingle um, put across the, the, the mouth there of its uh, the river mouth um, that the river was diverted by 15 miles to Rye and that became uh, the point at which Rye started to grow as an important port that it, it suddenly found itself on the sea and you know a, a site of great importance. Um, here at Hastings um, the two things that were really calamitous um, but very important for its later history is that the castle rock was very badly damaged. So if you look to the right hand side of the, the opening of the of the harbour, you can see where the castle is marked on the map. Um, the castle cliff was, was badly damaged, the part of the castle fell down at that point. Um, and a huge shingle bank was pushed up against the mouth of the harbour as well. Um, so effectively this this whole entrance where the boats were coming in in that previous picture was silted over with shingle and uh, it cut off the harbour from the sea so it became pretty useless as a as a harbour at that point and over the next um i don't know how long it took but over the next couple of hundred years that land gradually silted up more and more so certainly by the 18th century it was uh, stable enough to be built on and the inhabitants that had been living up on the White Rock area moved over the valley into the Bourne Valley and, and that became the premier site of Hastings. So that became what, what we now know as the Old Town became Hastings Town Centre. Um, if we have a look at the very last picture, we'll see the same view again, but as it looks um, a couple of hundred years later, so it's about 1820, and you can see here the same. You can see where well, you can see where the entrance to the sea was, um, and all of this land solid enough to be built on uh, at that point. So as Hastings landed up growing, um, really from the 16th century onwards, and started creeping out of the Bourne Valley, which is to the right hand side here, just where the last houses are along the seafront. That's the entrance to the old town. Um, and they started developing out of the old town around the castle cliff and because the land was now solid again they could start reclaiming some of this and, and building on it. So by 1820s this was uh, as I say was known as the Priory land because the Priory had once um, been very nearby and it was home to about a thousand people by 1830. Um, mostly people that were connected with shipbuilding or the ship trades so we know there were carpenters and um, masons and shipbuilders, people like that that were living here, lots of service industries and um, yeah, but a, a very, very small concentrated area for them to be living in. And that takes us up to about 1830 and we'll come back to that um, with another talk later on, Mary. Yeah, great. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it's fascinating. I mean, I've, I've heard these things and read about them over and again. So, but you explain it beautifully and simply and and, uh, and I think you have to kind of revisit history and maps a few times just to let it sink in. And then it's brilliant to go to the site and yeah. understand it. Yes, and, and if anybody wants to actually look at the, some of those images, um, all of the images and the maps that, that I've collected together, pretty much, um, some of them have been given to me by other historians, but um, a lot of them have come from Hastings Museum and Hastings Library, where the, the two places have incredible archives of, of local studies material. So you can actually still go into the library on the site you know, that you're looking at and actually look at those maps there. It's, it's phenomenal. Yes. We're very lucky. Fantastic. <laughs> Fantastic resource, brilliant. Yeah. I think that leads us into uh, the next part of the um, video, the raw. Mm. What I noticed more than anything, you couldn't look into the wind and breeze. 
you didn't dare open your mouth or anything like that. Mm. And if you needed to take a breath, you had to turn sideways. Because if you'd have gone like that, yeah, it wouldn't have done you any good. Yeah, and like pizza and everything would be blasted yeah. into your face. I'm frightening too, quite frightening. I don't think nobody really truly <laughs> grasped it early on. I think it was only a little bit later on when people realised just how bad it was. Yeah. Oh, it was awful. It was a roar. Yeah. A continuous roar. And it was horrible. Yeah, it was. Awful morning, bud, wasn't yeah. it? Awful. Well, that's all you can describe it as. Yeah, it's yeah, I'm roaring non-stop. I second that, bud, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it was a roar. You're absolutely right. I always remember coming down later that morning, looking down on the port side, as most of the boats were on the port side, all the copper nails were shining, weren't they? Where they'd been that's shot right. blasted. Yes, they were. Yes. Yeah, that was all nearly all wooden boats in them days. Yeah, and obviously right. copper nails that held them together. And they was all shiny copper, where the strength of the sand, there's nothing but you had a sand blaster on. But yeah, 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 it was a roar, you're absolutely right, yeah. The shit of a roof fell on Jim, it blew yeah. all the on Jim. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, of course the sad part about that is nobody knew he was under there. Had they got to him when it first happened, I mean it's all this and buts, I understand that, but had they got there you know, when it first came, all but the modern still been still been alive today. It was quite frightening, I have to say. Oh that. yeah. Yeah, it was yeah. frightening, never experienced anything like that. Yep, so we've got one more segment of that to come later on uh, in in the hour. So well, that me, section that you've just looked at, Mary, sorry, yes. that, that's got my, yeah, no. my favourite bit in, um, which is the sand blasting of the of the boats and the copper nails. I just, that's just such a phenomenal thing. It makes it so vivid, doesn't yeah, it? it really does. and, and the value of, of, so lucky that they agreed to talk to me and they're, they're they most of the fishing families have been on that beach for over 200 years. Mm -hmm. And the stories and the experiences are passed down, you know, from generation to generation. And I've been working for a little while with the Yasmin Ornsby and the Hastings Fisherman Protection Society getting that oral history. It's so important because mm -hmm. paper uh, and written accounts and photographs are, are invaluable because who knows when the digital world might come out. <laughs> but it is wonderful to have voices voices yeah. from a period isn't it in, yeah in yeah exactly and um, yeah we, when we come on to the next um talk the historical bit in, in a second um one of the people that i've really drawn very heavily on um is a, a local historian who lived in the 19th century um we refer to him as brett but his name yeah. is thomas brandon brett and he was an amazing man he was born in 1816 and actually his father died when he was only 10 years old so um it was quite a bit of a mystery of, around it because his father was a blacksmith um, but was found in a fisherman's boat um, and had died of arsenic poisoning so I, I don't know the full story behind that but um, it was a, a terrible tragedy you know, obviously for his family and um, Brett had to go out to work when he was very young so only 10 years old and recorded that he was then working 18 hours a day on average in order to help support his mother and his family because I think he was the oldest child mm. so he, he had a hand in everything he did like any job that was going he's absolutely incredible and later in, in life he founded the Hastings and St Leonard's Gazette um, in the 1850s wow. so he became a newspaper man and um, it, it's probably what he's most famous for today is his newspaper account and at the age of 82, he was persuaded by a friend to write down his reminiscences of life um, during the early 19th century, um, a part of which was lived on the America ground because um, he had a, when his mother remarried, she married a blacksmith and they were connected with the America ground. So she married a Mr. Woolgar. Um, I don't know if it's the same Mr. Woolgar that ran the blacksmith's arms, which was on the America ground, on the site of the Holy Trinity Church, um, but if it wasn't the same one that she was married to, it would have been a, a, a family relative because Brett was the accountant there. He did the bookkeeping. Um, so there was definitely a connection there between them. And uh, so some of his um, early recollections are of about life in the 1820s in this specific site. And he's an incredible storyteller. So he, he is writing at quite a... It, it, it's quite a long time after the events and he doesn't always get things right so you can't use him as absolute 100 percent this is factual history but he is such an amazing storyteller and um we'll hear some of his accounts of the 1830s and, and a storm in the 1820s as well in, in a moment um yeah we're, we're very lucky to have those again they are in the library yeah. um you can see them now on, on pdfs they're, they're massive volumes he wrote 10 volumes and they're about like you can't even see how big they are if I do that. Um, they're, they're massive portfolio volumes. Um, 
we're very lucky that there is a local group of historians led by Roy Penfold, um, who was one of the original um, the contributors to this salon, um, that he and a local group of volunteers are transcribing all of those because they're largely handwritten. So they're quite difficult things to, to read. You have to really get your eye in to, to read his handwriting. Mm -hmm. um, but you can now access a lot of that online as well. So if anyone wants to read more about what Brett has written, um, after this this webinar you can do and um, it, it gives you such a big you know like you say it's not always factually correct but it's such a uh, a feeling for mm. the period yeah and um i believe he had a very good satirical sense of humor as well yes yeah he's very very funny the, the, the stories are full of characters and you, you really feel like you've been there in the 1820s or or 30s with him so yeah, yeah it's, it's very similar to listening to that oral history and you know hearing that and hearing that as well that they really brings at home to you the human impact um, so the, the very end of that um, clip that we just heard, the fisherman talk about Jimmy Reed, who was one of the two people who died during the 1987 storm, and it, it's really, it, it really brings it home to you that these storms aren't just affecting the coastline in an interesting geographical way, they are they're real human tragedies as well. Yes, the Jimmy Reed tragedy was particularly uh, keenly felt in in the old town and the the bike race is a memorial bike race originally to raise funds for mm -hmm. uh, his family and other families in the same situation so mm -hmm. yeah um, and i think by focusing on on small details you can get a sense of the whole really but yeah. anyway i think this leads yeah. us into your next um uh, <coughs> A piece of uh, history on white rock vulnerability, massive waves, dr dramatic destruction of <laughs> houses. I'm just I'm reading from <laughs> from our notes, but yes, oh, I'll do my best. Take it away. <laughs> okay, well, I've just I've got a few more pictures to show you as well, so it okay. gives you a few more pictures on uh, of what the of what the site looks like on the on the ground. That will come up in a moment. Um, so yeah, here, here we are looking at uh, the White Rock, which looks very different today, again, for anyone that knows this area. Uh, the road that you can see on the left-hand side here with the wagons and the, the horses and people on is the road running up behind the White Rock Theatre, roughly. I think that's the, the start of that road. And uh, to the right-hand side of that, you can see this massive outcrop, um, which I pointed out on the on the uh, Anglo-Saxon picture. Um, so they were very picturesque rocks, but they also made life very, very difficult for people because they really blocked Hastings from uh, what was to the West. Um, in 1827, Hastings had become quite popular as a fashionable seaside resort. And th this is around the time of uh, the Prince Regent building uh, Brighton Pavilion, that's slightly earlier. Um, but all of the seaside coast had become really fashionable for sea bathing and um, uh, people people were coming from London just to do that and to take the sea air. Um, so in 1827, James Burton had started building what we now know as Burton St. Leonard's. There was nothing on that site before, it was just a quarry. Um, but he wanted to build fashionable houses for the rich and wealthy to come down and stay in. And that was all very well, but without an organic town to support it, there weren't any services to, to support them. So anyone coming down for the season would still have needed to buy food and have their lawn food done and um, things like that so the service industries all came from Hastings and people had to make their way around this rocky outcrop towards St Leonard's which was very very difficult not too bad in the summer although sometimes our summers can be quite um, scary as well um, in the winter it was pretty impassable so you'd land up having to go up over the hill of the white rock um, and down uh, the road that you can see here so very very difficult getting around it and, and that we'll come back to that later actually just remind me Mary because there's another thing I need to say about that later but I don't want to jump ahead but let's have a look at what's round the back of that rock and we should be able to see another view of the houses in the America ground on the next picture um, so here you can see them quite low lying there's no uh, sea defenses there's no sea wall built up or anything like that to protect the houses and anyone who lives in hastings will know how rough the sea can be even on a relatively calm day and here you get a sense of the swell of the sea and how powerful it is um, the next slide is going to show us a much more dramatic picture um, this will be a familiar sight to anyone who lives here. Um, so I, I have been part of this junction before. This is the top of Claremont and the start of Carlisle Parade. I've been part of the traffic lights there and 
completely submerged by a wave like that one, um, which has been quite fun and very dramatic. Um, so this is a very standard kind of thing that you will see in any winter storm in Hastings. And this is a photograph taken around about 1905. So it's not that long after the events of the 1834 storm, which was would have far reaching uh, consequences. Um, yeah, you can see the power of the waves. So the way that the sea is still trying to get into that natural harbour. Um, and if you think back to the very first slide that I showed you and the Anglo-Saxon picture, so here you've got the, the big building that you can see behind the wave. That is Palace Court. And this is behind that is the Hill of the White Rock where St Michael's Church was. So the sea is still really trying to get in to where it's, it's always wanted to be. And I think even now, sometimes that, that area is gets flooded quite, um, not badly, but it does still get flooded. Um, so let's just go on to the next picture and we'll have a look at, um, this again, 1820s. This picture actually appears in Brett and this is, this is an illustration that he chose to accompany um, his, uh, his, his account of the storm in 1834. And rather than me just tell you or paraphrase what he said. I thought I'd just read from Brett, so just bear with me while I bring that up. Um, yeah, so Brett talks about um, one of the things that was causing a problem. <clears throat> I mentioned the, uh, the white rock sticking out and causing a problem with the access between Hastings and St. Leonard's. Um, one of the things that caused a problem in Hastings was the fact that they were building uh, St. Leonard in the first place. Um, so he writes down here, this is from his uh, manuscript history that I mentioned before. Um, it had been noticed that the building of the South Colonnade, that's down in St. Leonard's, on the full of the beach and the raising of roads, parades and seawalls along the whole frontage of St. Leonard's had had the effect of forcing the sea more than ever upon the lower and less protected roads towards the old town, by which he means Hastings and, and the town um, nesting in the Bourne Valley, and even to the extent of undermining the White Rock Promontory. That's the rocky outcrop that I, I pointed out. This was especially the case on Saturday and Sunday, the 18th and 19th of October, 1834, when the property but recently erected at Stratford Place was partially undermined and great fears were entertained for the safety of the people there. Men, horses and carts were in pressing requisition and by the prompt application of faggots, piles, stone and other materials during the intervals of ebb and flow, further danger was fortunately but narrowly averted. The houses in the rope walk were also greatly damaged and some of them wholly destroyed. The rope walk we'll see in, the, in a minute, I'll point that out in a second on the next slide, um, but you can just see it, it's the, it's the houses that sit behind, well, basically the houses at the front there by the sea. Um, the houses in the rope walk were also greatly damaged and some of them wholly destroyed. Among the latter was a house belonging to Mr Murdoch at the southwest corner of the so-called America, a house which had formed a prominent object as seen from the top of the white rock. Um, he means the house, if you look at the picture, he means the house, as you're looking along the rock here, um, the very first house that you come to, I think that is the house that he means. And that is roughly where number one Carlisle Parade is, which he goes on to say. Um, and if we just go on to the next picture, we should be able to see a better view, showing a slightly different view of, of that house and the rope walk sitting behind it. So it's running along from west to east towards the uh, Castle Hill. This picture actually appears in Brett, as I said. So he, he says, the annexed view, as sketched from nearly midway of the road leading over the White Rock to Bex Hill, shows Murdoch's two-dwelling cottage at the foot of the hill, near to where is now number one Carlisle Parade, together with some of the priory and rope walk property in its rear. Also the castle and a portion of the East Hill in the distance. But this house and others, as before stated, were washed down by the great tide of October 1834, soon after which the road was levelled, the picturesque cliff was cut back, a parade was formed and houses were erected. From one of the other houses, which shared a similar fate to that of Murdoch in 1834, a Mrs Morris and her infant had to be taken out of a bedroom window and carried to a place of greater safety. 
The woman thus rescued lived many years after in St. Leonard's to tell of her adventure. And later on in his, um, in his manuscript, Brett also talks about the people that left the America ground and set up home in St. Leonard's. And the name Morris does appear in that list. And given that the Brett himself landed up living in Norman Road, he almost certainly knew her personally. I'd love to know which house she actually was rescued from, but I, I'm afraid I don't know, and I've not been able to find out yet. Um, it's also worth saying, looking at this slide, um, Brett talks about the parade being erected and, and the rocky outcrop being sorted out later on. Um, developers by the 1830s, developers were really keen to start clearing the ground of all the commercial property that was on there and really wanted to turn Hastings into a very fashionable um, development. And they'd already started cutting back the White Rock. They'd cut a road through the White Rock, in fact, at one point, and the cliff of the White Rock was cut back and back and back. I mean, to the extent that actually when they uh, when they cut part of it back, they dislodged a cemetery that was uh, a cemetery that had belonged to St. Michael's Church. And so they, they found um, graves that had been cut actually into the cliff face at that time. And bones had been found at the back there as well. Um, so they, they really were trying to kind of creep back into the, the, the coastal landscape themselves just to develop the town. And only three weeks after the storm that Brett is talking about, Princess Victoria, who was then 15 and not yet queen, um, came down to St. Leonard's to, to stay here for, the, for a few weeks with her mother. They travelled down from London. They travelled through the old town because that was the route from London in those days. And she had to come along through this priory ground, past these houses. And because the storm had done so much damage, her carriage couldn't get around the seafront side. So it had to go up over the hill. The horses couldn't pull the horse, the, the carriage up over the hill. She had to be drawn by hand to get over to St. Leonard's. And it was such an arduous journey that she gave her full support to the developers who wanted them to remove the White Rock completely. And by December 1834, that had been gunpowdered out of the way. So the White Rock today is one of the reasons why it looks so different to us today. It no longer sticks out into the sea like that because it was literally blasted out of the water um, to create this better access and a proper new road put in um, so that rich and wealthy people could get to St Leonard's. So that's the last slide of that one, Mary. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it's, it's fascinating. And uh, yeah, uh, it's great to have all these things in such a sequence. And through like, events like the storms, you can really understand the development of the town because of the way you presented it. Um, we were going to have a bit of a chat here, but we're running out on time. So should we go into the, um, the first hand accounts of Kevin Borman and Philip Squire? who uh, I recorded talking about their experience in the 1987 hurricane, which was as powerful and as devastating as the um, 13th century one and the 1824. I certainly didn't see Michael Fish on the TV saying there was nothing to worry about. I have no recollection of, of it being forecast to be bad. I mean, in, in, in the job I do now, actually, I, I, I'm quite used to getting weather warnings and forecasting, of course, is a lot better now than it was over 30 years ago. I think there was talk of, a, of a, it being a bit windy, um, um, a bit rough, but nothing, we weren't expecting anything sort of on the scale, obviously, of, of what happened. So I suppose the evening was just as normal, really. I was called out in the very early hours. From memory, it was about half past midnight, quarter to one. This is my memory of it, of when it was actually happening, was waking up and hearing, you know, it was really, really, really windy, you know, stronger than normal. So I remember opening the curtain and looking out the back patio area and the bin, the dustbin, you didn't have wheelie bins in those days, just dustbin, had been blown over, all the rubbish, had blown out of the bin and the, the, the rubbish was being blown right up in the air sort of how i remember it it was, it was like quite high and it was, it was just rubbish blowing everywhere in the back garden and i didn't think to look out the front of the front of the house which is where the damage was in the morning really in the park I'll never forget the uh, the phone call it was from someone who was a supervisor at tunbridge who, who told me just to let you know governor that there's a tree on the line near pad of wood but don't worry the pway are on call on their way, um, no, no need to worry, I just thought I ought to let you know. Well, that of course woke me up, and um, I could see then that it was... Certainly not in the back garden, it was 
just rubbish strewn everywhere and being blown everywhere. And, uh, and then I really didn't think any more of it then. I went back um, to bed. I looked out the window, I could see things going past the window. It was almost a bit like Wizard of Oz and Dorothy. Um, in fact, it was roof stage from my neighbour's roof um, because Hastings actually suffered very badly. Indeed. And sort of, I don't know what time I got up, probably seven-ish, I would imagine, maybe just before. I think I was probably the first one up in the house because my, my father worked at the same place as me. So getting up in the morning and looking out the front was quite a shock, as you can imagine. I set out and... Um, in fact, I should never forget, I, I used to live very close to my nan and she stood, she was awake, the, the wind had woken her up and um, she stood on the door and said, you're not going out in this, are you, Kevin? I said, I've got to, nan, yeah. And um, so it, it kept her awake. And, 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 and even then, um, it, was, it was pretty windy. I mean, it was really, really quite windy. And I'm so I'm used to the wind living on, on, on the coast. Um, so I started my drive up to what I thought was going to be Tunbridge or Tunbridge so World. I, I sat down and basically what I saw in the morning just like huge trees just strewn everywhere, you know, like right around the reservoir opposite us and uh, all down the road as far as you could see, really. My memories, to my memory serves me there, it wasn't actually a full blockage on the road because I think a lot of the trees that went down in the park actually fell in the park. There wasn't much on the road. There was like debris and that, you know, branches. And I know that there was a car down the road that was that had been crushed by... Obviously, there were some trees block, partly blocking the road, um, and, and in those days, right where the, um, the, the, the the old church used to be, it's still there. It's not a church anymore. There used to be a, by the corner of the garage. There used to be an old telephone box. And of course, in those days, and people don't realise this now, there were no mobile phones. 1987, completely unheard of mobile phones. So I had no way of being in contact with people except by using public phones. I went to take these photos, so that obviously would have been late to the same day. I mean, obviously, I went to work. Is it a Tuesday morning or Monday morning? I can't remember now. I think it's something like the 19th of October. I didn't actually pass my driving test, something like that. That would have been the same week. There were some trees block, partly blocking the road. Um, and, and in those days, right where the, um, the, the, the the old church used to be, it's still there, it's not a church anymore, there used to be, a, by the corner of the garage, there used to be an old telephone box. And of course, in those days, and people don't realise this now, there were no mobile phones, 1987, completely unheard of mobile phones. So I had no way of being in contact with people except by using public phones or railway phones. So I stopped at the... Um, the, 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 the telephone box in Mortlington and said, look, I, there, there were a number of trees partly blocking the A220, it's really quite dangerous. And um, the, the emergency operator said, there's nothing we can do about it. Trees are coming down across East Sussex and Kent. Um, just be aware that we know it and, and, and it's too dangerous really for us to go out at the moment. Um, trees are coming down all over. We live by the park. We got it first hand really, the, the absolute devastation of what it had done because a lot of the damage was caused because there was heavy rainfall in recent days before the, before the storm. Obviously, that softened everything up, so the wind had taken full toll on, on the, the trees by the uh, reservoir. I mean, they'd just gone down like nine pins. Yeah, it, it was just one of the shock and, a, and amazement, really, in my view. It was, it was, just, it was a, well, a scene of devastation, but it was quite an amazing thing to see, really. It was like, it, you know, it brings home to you the power of how nature really, I suppose, what, what it can actually do. Um, you know, trees that were probably well over a hundred years old, it's gone overnight, you know. And um, suddenly I, I came across a, a massive tree blocking the road. I just couldn't get past. It was a huge tree. It must have been 60, 70, 80 foot tall, completely blocking the road. And, and as I got out, I couldn't stand up. Um, I was almost blown over, so I couldn't stand up, and I was crouching down, and um, I could feel my face was really being cut by the twigs and the branches that were blowing around. It was like being in a maelstrom. Um, you, 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 I, I, I've never had that experience. I don't think I've ever seen anything like that in, in my lifetime again, to be honest with you, because, well, it's, it's obviously something that stuck in my mind. Um, I don't know, just the, just the scale of it as well. So yeah, it, it came in sort of miles and miles away down the coast. And worked its way had 
unofficial radios, and, and we started to hear. But in, in, in the very early news broadcast, it, it, no one realised just how serious it was. And it was only as, as daylight broke that you could see. And in the end, um, the railway line was shut for three days. The line was completely blocked. I understand something like 3,000 trees were blocking the line between Hastings and Tunbridge. We had to call the army out. Um, and, and in fact, I worked the whole of that night. I worked most of the next day and the Saturday and the Sunday. It still brings sort of thoughts, lots of thoughts back every year on the anniversary in October. The hair stand on my end, and I, as, as I realised just how close I was. And when I think of all those trees that were down, and when I was stuck there, I couldn't go forward. And suddenly, I realised that my route back was being hampered by these trees coming down behind me. I had to sort of drive across the part of the embankment out of off the road just to get past as these trees were coming down the electricity cables were sparking blue my, my hands were cut my face was cut i couldn't stand up hello back again um i think julie we we because we've enjoyed ourselves too much we've only got 10 minutes left <laughs> yeah I, I just wanted to say I, it was amazing hearing um philip um talking about his experiences and saying i'm never going to see anything like that in, in my lifetime ever again yeah and, um, I think you'd found out something interesting about the 1987 storm, Mary, haven't you? Um, how, how, yes. rare, how rare that kind of storm is. Yeah, it says it says uh, in the, on, from the Met, the Met Office UK, there's some fantastic research on uh, storms and hurricanes plus wonderful images, which we were going to discuss at the end, but I think we're going to run out of time a bit. So, uh, but they, they, they say comparisons of the October 1987 storm with previous storms were inevitable. Even the oldest residents of the worst affected areas couldn't recall winds so strong or destruction on such a great scale. Mm -hmm. And even well inland, gusts exceeded 80 knots. The London Weather Centre recorded 182 knots at 2 minutes, 2.50 a.m. and 86 knots recorded at Gatwick. Um, and also the, the Paul Joy talks in, in the, the last short video about changes to the shoreline and the increasing uh, uh, storms that uh, he's seen because, you know, he's, um, I think he's in his 70s now and he's always been a fisherman. And so the weather is, you breathe it, feel it, it, it controls your life. And so that's quite interesting. I had a, had, I've had a quick scan because I'm obviously no climate change or weather expert. But, and we're all aware of it. Um, and I think the, the big thing is, is I think for most of us, we feel helpless to affect any change that might turn, turn the sort of the events the other way, uh, but we're all kind of willing to do something. So that's interesting. And, and you do wonder if arts, heritage and science, who are, you know, age old collaborators, can, can collaborate more to make this more accessible through um, programs like this, so through salons like this, where you can pick on events in a microscope, uh, but you can see the impact, the huge impact that it has. Yeah. So, yeah. we, have a, we have a request in the Q&A box ah. um, to, in, to include the MET uh, videos. And if we have to um, cut down on time, that's the thing that we should include. So I think we should actually have a look at some of those. Um, so the, the Met pictures. The Met images. Should we do yeah. that now? And then um, the, uh, hopefully we'll have some time uh, just at the end to see Paul Joy's um, account of, of weather changes. Yeah, um, shall I just say a quick thank you to everybody now so that we, um, <laughs> uh, just in case we run out of, run out of time. So obviously very much thank you to you, Julie. You've been a fabulous support and your research is absolutely brilliant. And to um, our invisible guests, Philip Squire, Kevin Borman, uh, Paul Joy, Pete and Bud White, Peter White, and obviously MSL Productions for conceiving this. And um, you know, we, you know, that I'm so, so pleased to be taking part. I know you've had to, you've sort of more or less done every one, so you're kind of, you know, <laughs> sort of right in there. But yes, thank you very much. And specifically to Laura uh, from My Station Station, who's been uh, a star. I think that's, have I done all the thank yous? Is that good? I think so. <laughs> <laughs> and all the, all the people who gave us all the images yeah. and their time and yeah. support. So let's show the image, the Met images quickly. Yeah.
Yeah, this is very interesting. This is actually showing the storm uh, Kira, isn't it? So yes. uh, we've talked a lot about the 1987 storm and the earlier storms. Um, but the one that we, I don't know if anybody remembers it now, it seems like such a long time ago. Um, but back in February, we had an amazing storm in Hastings, it was Storm Kira. And this is showing uh, the passage of that storm. So the, the little um, triangles on it are six hourly intervals of the passage of the storm. And there's a beautiful, satellite image of that as well which um, shows it from above where you can see the, the cloud formation. This is as it was leaving um, America um, so it hadn't yet reached, I don't know which way it was going, it must have been coming from America to us, I don't know. Um, but uh, yeah this is as it, as it was leaving the coast there so it's beautiful, it looks beautiful here. It, it, it's the, the beautiful graphic images, Yeah, it, it, it makes it tangible somehow to, to yeah. see how and that all kind of takes place. I think there's know, a similarity there. There's a similarity there as well between the, the, the beauty and the peacefulness of that image looking down on the clouds from above. What's actually going on the ground, as we know, you know, was was pretty horrendous. I mean, the, the storm, the winds um, that were recorded in, in the UK, the highest um, wind was nearly 100 miles an hour on the Isle of Wight. So on the ground, this is very different. But from the air, from above, it just looks so peaceful and so calm. And when you look at your coastal footage from the plain, the, the whole seafront looks calm and peaceful. It looks like yeah. nothing could, could harm it. And yet it's so fragile. And it just doesn't need very much to actually change to really affect it quite dramatically. Um, so it, it's quite phenomenal seeing that. And I think we, we, we all need to be aware more of uh, the, the way human beings impact the change climate change i mean the information is constantly out there but we're all busy getting on with our lives and trying to earn a living but it, it is uh yeah that's I, I think there's another slide coming up as well which just shows yeah. the the weather the rainfall um this is the this is the this is the wind gust actually this is showing all the weather stations that have recorded yeah, the wind uh, gusts around the uk um, yes the so recorded wind gusts of 84 97 miles an hour at yeah, needles yeah. Yeah, so phenomenal. that's that's pretty yeah. phenomenal that, that's yeah. that's pretty much up to the strength of the 1987 yeah. uh, one and these and are radar images yeah aren't yes. they of rain. Yeah, and a tremendous amount of rainfall so um in some in some areas they recorded um, the month average rainfall for february fell within 18 hours so that's a phenomenal amount of february rain in one well, less than a day basically. and i think we will remember the appalling flooding and the the people who are now still suffering because yeah. winter storm after winter storm never yeah. allows them to get back to zero um yeah yeah and i think we're going to hear paul joy talk about some of the coastal changes that he's seen which will tie in very neatly with that so it's, that's your next uh, video i think Mary. yes yeah anyway well thank you and i've uh, i hope everyone who's uh, actually joined us have en has enjoyed it and people who consequently you can watch all the videos uh on uh let me let me get my piece of paper so i, don't, I get this right <laughs> um all all the salons will be on mslprojects.co.uk uh so go onto the website uh, with lots more in history and information and work that artists and writers have contributed to the, the whole project of the, of the um, Trinity Triangle America Ground project. So, yeah, so, so say goodbye and thank you very much. And I guess we're gonna, we're gonna go out with Paul Joy, okay. Yeah, there's been some dramatic changes in the period of, I've been fishing for, for 48, 50 years. So it's, uh, it's more prominent now. The wind is is probably the main factor, which has been increased on a on a daily basis or yearly basis. Uh, if you had 36 knots, you had a gala wind. That was an unusual event. Now the winds uh, in the 60s, 70 miles an hour during even during the summer period, where you had distinct season. So you've got uh, winter times, you'd have your, your gales and sometimes severe gales, but the gales themselves were not as strong as they are today. And it's a, it's a known phenomenon that, that global change means that more extremes of weather. So we're getting extremely windy. The longshore drift is, is what's more 
prominent nowadays. We get more wind as you shift in more beach. And uh, the changes in, in the harbour, when uh, many years ago we could row around the inside of the harbour, the, uh, the beach was uh, so far down uh, compared to where it was many, many years ago. Obviously, the, the, uh, the creation of shingle has, has taken the beach further out. And on, uh, when you had the girls of wind, they reached right up to my windshield. The water, the water would come up. We've had the boats touching the windshield in the winter period. But the winter period, the, the storms were gales force eight, force nine. Occasionally, you may have a storm ten, which is a very rare precedent. But now it's not unusual. Even in the summer months, we get winds of higher capacity than we did years ago. Rising of, uh, water, water volumes is uh, also something which looks to be taken into consideration when you're building anything in the future. Ice, ice caps melting, water tables going up. And more, presumably more developments. Well, there's also everything goes with the building. There's a, there's a, there's a sewage phenomenon and if we've got the capacity to deal with everything uh, on a safe basis and not pollute the waters. You can't say, although climate change has been proved to be happening, is the what comes with climate change is, is uh, the problem which we're not too sure about how we're going to go in the future. We might be underwater here in a few years. Yeah, well <laughs> doesn't come from so the shingle bank. Though. That's a nice age deposit. Yeah, that's so that's 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 not moving the shingle from there because it's uh, so the shingle's coming from somewhere and it's coming on a, a yearly basis from somewhere. May not have lasted very long. I don't know, um, but it would have dropped away to 11 and then 10, and it had been building up to that before. And so for a long time, it was very, very windy. But I don't know. I ain't got a clue really. But that would have been where most of the damage was done. Um, it was horrible. Yeah, it was awful morning, bud. Wasn't yeah, it? awful. Yeah. Older is coming. 
covered in dust, barefoot we stray from a world in decay. Take a small piece and the colors will stay into gray.